You seem to be on mute. There we go. I am. I am. Okay, so there, there you go. That's a Monday morning start, eh? Nothing worked. <laughs> Anyway, it's, uh, we are now live and all functioning. This is Grant Adlam and KZN Top Business Masterclass. Today, we've got the A-team here again, and obviously on the subject of Poppy and the practical side of Poppy. And, that, and they're going to go through the presentation. So at home, in your office, wherever you're sitting, if you feel you want to interact and, and ask questions, we will pause in between each one, if necessary, just to get the flow going, because there's nothing worse than going on for an hour the question you had in the beginning, you've forgotten at the end. It is relevant. So we just, we're just going to try and make it as interactive as possible. So I'm, we're going to jump in straight into it. Who's going to start on your side? And let's just get cracking. Perfect. So I'm going to get us going on the practical side of Poppy. And you are right. Um, we do say that a bit tongue in cheek when we really uh, speak about Poppy because of the way the legislation is. However, I think uh, we can almost call it little hacks that we're going to try to give you to, to really cut through the legislation and achieve that compliance um, a lot easier and not taking the long route route, essentially. So if we jump into it, obviously, um, we discussed the eight conditions the last time we were here. You have to make sure that you're complying with those eight conditions at all time. I'll touch on them a, um, in a bit, but I think the most important thing to, to really understand is that this is a continuous process and really that entire life cycle of personal information from when we collect it, use it, store it, uh, store it or destroy it is very, very important. And every one of those stages, we need to be complying with the eight conditions. So that's where the tick box approach really becomes a problem because your checklist would be endless um, in essence. So we're going to cover the uh, life cycle and how we're going to really cut through the red tape for that. And then I would like to chat to you guys about a little shortcut that we use, our stop, drop and roll shortcut. So if we move on to our personal information life cycle. I cannot emphasize this enough. We really need to think whenever we hear the term processing, because that is the language used throughout Poppy when we process information, we must be compliant. We are speaking about this entire phase. So one of the big misconceptions that uh, my colleagues will touch on later is that we only need to be compliant in this collection phase, which is very, very untrue. Um, often our biggest issues come in with the use and the storage of, of it because we're not sometimes using it in, in line with our direct purposes like we have to. Um, and then the storage phase, that's where generally we would see our security breaches. You know, maybe we've suffered a hack or an employee's picked up files and left with them a the front of employee. So these spaces are very, very important. They are as important as the collection phase. And then when we decide to either delete or archive, or we have to in terms of the law, this also needs to follow its own process in terms of copy. It's not just about, uh, you know, throwing away a piece of paper in a bin or necessarily deleting a file of your computer. We need to make sure that it's properly um, deleted and if it's archived, it's properly protected in that phase. So we must just be aware that this process of uh, personal information and in particular the life cycle is extremely important. Each one of these phases we must be compliant in. So if we look now to our stop, drop and roll as we call it, if you take away anything I think from today, you just remember the stop, drop and roll, that will help you. So step one, when we stop, ensure that you have consent to process the personal information. So obviously we don't always need consent, James will touch on that in a bit. Um, we either need consent or a justification, but consent is the safest way to go about it. Uh, we are very, very pro-consent here at Labournet. So ensure you that, that you have consent to actually do what you want to do with the information. Step two, when we drop, only process that personal information. So where we're collecting it, using it, deleting it, archiving it, storing it, whatever, in line with its original purpose. So if I've collected your information to provide a industrial relation retainer to you here at Labanet, I can't now go and use that information for direct marketing to sell another product to you. That's not allowed. So I collected it for the IR uh, retainer purpose. We must deliver on uh, the IR retainer, nothing else necessarily. And then our role, our third step, and this is our minimum access. So limit access to the personal information. Not everyone in your organization needs access to everything. 
you need to segment it. Um, you know, payroll does not need to be accessed by IT. There's no reason IT should be accessing your, your payroll or necessarily, or unless there's some process in your company that requires it. But in general, try to departmentalize access. It, it creates a much safer zone because this is really where your risks come in. James is also going to touch on this a lot uh, a bit later, but this is where employees email things out by accident, leave files on desks, um, cars get stolen with laptops and information in it. If we look at the looting that happened in Durban um, last year, you know, all those computers that were stolen, that is a security breach. Someone cannot access that information on it. So by, you know, locking away laptops, departmentalizing who's got access to what, at least if that laptop goes missing, you don't have an individual with access to everything in your company. It is, you can limit the amount of damage that would necessarily happen to you. So then, if we look at the rest of Poppy, we have touched a bit on this previously, but just to reiterate, Poppy is not necessarily new. It was adopted and government gazetted in 2013. It came into effect in 2020. But due to our year transition period really became enforceable last year, June in 2021. Um, I often get asked, so what's happened in this year? That it's been enforceable since June last year and quite a bit has actually been going on um, in the background with the information regulator. The information regulator is obviously the governing body of, of Poppy and Pyre and um, they ensure compliance to it and distribute fines, etc. And really in the background, we've seen them release a lot of guidance notes on how to process information. We just got a guidance note, I believe it was in the banking industry on how to process information in that industry. So they really are now um, defining processes for us and giving us a lot more than we had previously with just the act, because the act is really just a skeleton that must be fleshed out still. So a lot is going on. Um, there is public hearings into Pia for not giving access to information in the music industry. We currently, uh, there's also an investigation going on into the police who um, there was a leak of victims information from the Krugersdorf uh, rapes that happened when they were filming that music video. There, the victims' names were uh, floating around and circulating on social media, and now the information regulator is looking at, you know, who to hold accountable for that. So a lot is happening. Um, it may not be so much in our faces, but if you follow the information regulator on LinkedIn or on Facebook, there is a lot happening in the background. So we just must be aware things are going to start coming, and they really are going to start holding us accountable because they are giving us all the tools to become compliant. As I mentioned, we've got these eight basic conditions we've got to comply with throughout the different phases. When we speak about PIA, PIA is the Promotion of Access to Information Act. So this is a separate act to Poppy, but it is also governed by the information regulator and they are almost sister acts. So we look at them together. So we just must remember every private and public body now needs a PIA manual. There is no exception to that. So if you do not have a PIA manual, the information regulator even has basic templates for you to use, but you need a PIA manual and it needs to be on your website. It is one of the easiest ways to practically comply. Put in your PIA manual, put your copy information in it and put it on your website and at your head office. It's a very easy way to achieve that compliance in terms of PIA. With the information regulator, we must register our information officers with them, as well as the deputy information officers and report any breaches. Those are the three main things we need to do with the information regulator register our information officers, our deputy information officers, and then obviously report any breaches from any unauthorized access that may occur for a hack or files missing or anything like that. I've also put in here that it's a national act, which means that it applies to the entire of South Africa. Anyone processing personal information in South Africa is going to have to comply with Poppy. Obviously, there's some requirements we look at, but in general, if you're processing personal information in the country, you're going to need to comply. So even if you're a German-based company processing here, you're, you need compliance to the Act. There is no exceptions if you have only two employees or you're a small company or it's this industry. There is no exclusions really um, to the Act. If you're processing, you must comply. So I just wanted to dispel that myth that I've, I've heard floating around quite a bit. And then obviously we know there's fines or imprisonment from non-compliance. So we can um, ascertain what will happen if um, we don't get copyright. 
Now, these are the eight conditions that um, I've been speaking about. We have touched on them just very briefly to go through them. So we have accountability, the responsible party, the party processing the personal information must take account accountability and put processes in place to actually comply with copy. Our processing limitation speaks to when we can process information. These are the sections that give us if we need consent or if there's justifications for it. Our purpose specification speaks to the fact that we have to have a defined purpose in order to process the information, and it must be quite specific. We can't just say for business purposes, that's too vague. Um, further processing limitations speaks to when we have personal information already and we process for purpose A, can I now process for purpose B? In certain instances, you can. There's some factors we do consider there as well, which James will touch on. Our information quality really speaks to the fact that our information in our position should be updated, accurate, and not misleading at, at all, so that we are operating with the correct personal information. Our openness condition speaks to us having a PIA manual um, and creating that transparency within our business to allow data subjects to access information we have. That very much links into our last condition, data subject participation, where they can actually ask you what information you hold about them and you would provide that, that, those details. And then our condition number seven there, which is our security safeguards. This is obviously how we protect personal information and what requirements are there. We will dive into these as we go along, James and Yumna will touch on them. Um, so I just wanted to take you briefly through them. Then the key role players in, in Poppy. So if any of you have caught on by now, I'm really laying the foundation down and the basic concepts to understand and Yumna and James are really going to start taking you through the hacks. So we've got four main key role players here, um, and that's our data subject, the responsible party, the operator, and the information officer. So our data subject is obviously the person whose the information belongs to. Now, this doesn't only have to be a natural person, it can also be a juristic entity because Poppy protects their information as well. So LabourNet as an entity is protected by Poppy as well, as well as me and your man James. A responsible party is the party collecting and using that information for a particular purpose. So if I'm collecting your information to provide you with a poppy retainer at LabourNet, then LabourNet is the responsible party. I'm an employee of LabourNet, so I'm seen as part of the responsible party. Our operator is a third party who's not employed by us. So third party out of our organization can be an individual or a company who processes information on our behalf. So these are people we literally hire to process the information for some purpose. To give the easiest example is always an outsourced payroll company. So you are providing your employees information so that they can uh, run payrolls for you. So that would be an operator that also a key role player. We must remember who they are because we need agreements with them if we are going to hire them. And then fourthly, our information officer. This is the head of your organization who will be registered with the information regulator. If you do not register your information officer, they will still be held accountable. So there's no way of really escaping accountability for them. They are defaulted to be the head of your organization. So your CEO or your MD, depending on how you are structured. Then you would register them and they are the person who is responsible for copy compliance in your organization and will also work with the information regulator on any um, fines or investigations that may come. The types of data subjects that we, we generally see um, it can belong to different categories of people, but in our environment, generally, we experience our own personal information. So us as a data subject, our co-workers, so um, I have, I'm in possession of James and Yumna's personal information, for example, um, the company as a whole, LabourNet's personal information, as well as our clients and potentially our suppliers could fall under that category as well. So we must remember we are playing with multiple different types of data subjects, with multiple different types of uh, stakeholders, and then having to comply with multiple different types of laws. So this is where it tends to get a little bit tricky. So we must make sure we're not necessarily forgetting a category of data subject or, or stakeholders. We've got to make sure that each of them are compliant and we are processing in that way. Now, this is one thing that I think is, is very, very important to, to discuss when we are speaking about the practical sides of Poppy. So in terms of, of the practical sides, we need to make sure that we're achieving like inherent compliance instead of just paper compliance. 
you know, I can send you five policies that you can sign today and put in a file that will make it look like you're copy compliant. But whether those processes in the policies are actually coming alive within your organization, you are not going to achieve inherent compliance. You will only have paper compliance, which causes a number of problems um, for you down the line. But in essence, in order to, to achieve inherent compliance, it is going to protect your organization. You as an employer are going to be protected because you are processing your employees, your clients, your suppliers information correctly. So your chances of going under investigation, having a complaint or being reported is limited in that regard. Your employees as well need to follow the policies and actually actively have them um, in their day-to-day -day functions because our employees are our biggest risks. They are the ones processing our personal information or the different types of categories every day. So we must make sure that they know what to do because Poppy ultimately is calling for a change in behavior. So to just put a policy in place without coming alive in terms of procedures and processes in the organization, it's gonna be a very pointless activity for you and you're still going to actually get fined by the information regulator. And then it also protects our clients' information. So by actually putting good data management systems in place, we're, collect, we're protecting all, all this data that we have, and our clients will have more confidence in us. So it will provide, if we do this correctly, we will uh, find practical exposure to weaknesses. So where are our weaknesses? What do we need to fix in it? It will prepare us for any audits or investigations that we may go under. As I mentioned, it will give stakeholders confidence um, in our responsibility to manage their, their, their data. The biggest thing we are seeing with the big data breaches that are happening is data subjects are no longer trusting those companies. Why should I give you my information? You leaked it the last time. That's sort of the attitude that's happening, which if individuals don't want to give us their personal information, we're not going to be able to operate as businesses. So it's very, very important that our clients ha have this perception that they have confidence in our data management systems. And then finally, it will bring us in harmony with international standards. This helps us um, trade with, with foreign companies. It opens up, us up to international markets where a lot of companies overseas at the moment, we are seeing they do not want to work with companies who have not got, achieved poppy compliance. We get it all the time. I need to do a deal with someone in London. Please, can you get me poppy compliance in two weeks? It's not going to happen. Um, we're going to achieve paper compliance, not inherent compliance. So just keep this in mind. If you put in a good data management system and you work with Poppy, you're putting in international best practices, in essence, into your business. It's not going to hinder you. It is going to help you. Our data is very, very important. It is the new oil. We need to protect it. And then finally, um, compliance is is a continuous process. This is not a once-off exercise. It's not I tick a couple of boxes and I'm done. Poppy will walk with us for a very, very long time. I keep saying we need to achieve the new Poppy normal. And eventually we will get there. There's still a lot of pushback, but eventually we will get there. So why do I think it's a continuous process? So the first thing is this open-ended definition of the term reasonable, which is used throughout the act. We must take reasonable steps to do something. It's a very, very difficult standard to set because my reasonable standards as an attorney would probably be up here compared to someone else's reasonable standards, which is down here. So I do foresee that the term reasonable is really going to be defined out in court or either in a guidance note, and that will give us more direction. But in, until we have that, it's, it's going to be a continuous issue where we actually have to continuously develop our business processes to try to keep achieving a higher standard of compliance. I do think we're also going to see many developments of the Act. As I've mentioned, it's quite a skeleton at the moment. We've been getting new guidance notes almost on a monthly basis, which provides more guidance. And often we have to go back and change things for our clients. We've had to change a number of times mm -hmm. already um, in, in this instance. And then we have our stakeholder requirements. Um, this needs to continuously step up. And I believe we should be engaging with our clients and our stakeholders. You know, if they don't have confidence in what we're doing, we need to take that feedback and actually um, build our data management processes in, in a better way. Um, investigations are going to happen continuously. This, uh, you could go on four investigations a year, nothing stops that from happening. So that's something we're continuously gonna to have to make sure we are compliant. So at no point we have investigations. In terms of breaches, our security standards are continuously going to have to be updated. Otherwise, we may suffer breaches. 
And then as we go along, we're finding more ways to be efficient in complying with the compliance. So I don't think it's just a, a, a few ticks and we're done. Um, I'm not sure what your guys' opinion on it. Yeah, it's definitely something we need to constantly update and keep an eye on because as, as you mentioned there's this it's, it's a skeleton act at the moment and it's still developing a lot it's growing a lot and if we lose track of that we can very very quickly lose our compliance as well and just be it'll be obsolete very very quickly yeah and i think something else to consider is um obviously we've been seeing a number of security breaches happening and all we've seen um out there and globally is just this increase in technological advancements that are coming along that are making things harder for companies. Mm -hmm. And that just shows the need to constantly be on the board, understand what's happening, what changes are happening within your company, how do we need to change our policies and get everything in line with that. It shows that we need to just become slightly more aware. And in becoming aware, we are ultimately making um, proper uh, and compliance in itself a continuous process. Also, like another thing to keep in mind is with, uh, with the implementation of the Puppy Act in South Africa, data and, and personal information is automatically increased in value. It's originally obviously still worth something. It's a company asset. But with the act coming into play now, it automatically increases that value because now you've got regulations to follow as well. So we've noticed, you know, as you said, we've noticed a massive increase in data breaches, specifically this year, we, we deal, we help by helping our clients all the time with data breaches at the moment. And I do feel that it is because that data has now become a lot more valuable to, to, to hold as ransom, I suppose. Yeah, I think, um, as I mentioned, data is the new oil, um, you know, unorganized data is not really worth much, but what, once we have it organized on our systems and things like this, um, and I often get told, no, but my data is not important. No one will take it. But it's important to you. And that's why they hold it yeah. ransom, because now they also know that we're being held accountable to these standards. So if they go and publish this information, because we don't pay a Bitcoin a demand or something like that, then we have a massive breach on our hands. Mm. And it's affecting reputations more than anything else. I think from a lot of what we've seen, there's been this attitude of, ugh, Copy, ugh, we don't care, mm. ugh, we'll get to mm. it eventually. And now what's happening is that attitude has caused companies to have huge reputational damage. Mm. And that's not good. People are running from these companies. And I believe if you don't have a good data management system, take Poppy out of out, even if we didn't have Poppy, the times we're living in, we need to have good data management systems. We shouldn't just be trying to achieve Poppy compliance. We should be trying to have a great data management system so that we do not suffer these breaches and our reputation is not damaged. Yeah. For example, imagine if we suffered a massive breach here at Labanet. We have over a thousand poppy clients. Yeah. They would be hitting the road so, so quickly. 100%. And that's what we really, really need to take into account. And the thing is also, this is not, this is not assumptions. This is stuff that's happening. Yeah, this fact, is, this is yeah, like, you know, information being held ransom for Bitcoins. And this is stuff that is genuinely happening as, as we speak right now. Yeah. Um, it's real. It's, yeah. Yeah. The Department of Justice, um, not this year, it was last year, their emails were hacked and held ransom. That's our Department of Justice. Yeah, it's intense. <laughs> it's, it's insane. We were emailing judges on Gmail accounts because uh, the systems just didn't work. So it's very, very important um, to achieve data management so, so that we, you know, protect our reputation and as well. And James is talking about, you know, we're seeing it now. That's how we're able to, that's how we're mm. able to talk to this. And um, this morning, actually, I had a 15 minute refresher training with employees. And that was just to remind them that, hey, we almost had a data breach the other day. Thankfully, we have the, everything in place to stop it from happening. But that just also shows that we need to have that continuous training of everyone within our organization. It's all good and well, you know, being paper compliant versus inherent compliance. And part of that is ensuring that we're continuously training our employees to be aware of their obligations, their responsibilities, but also to take note of what's happening around us. Um, to be sure that they're aware of what to look out for and that kind of thing. And that falls into compliance being a continuous process. No, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Grant, before we move on with the presentation, are there any questions that we can maybe answer on the first section of the presentation? You, you know, I, the one question came up and I'm trying to find it, but what, the question was, we're talking about a system. It's all very well being poppy compliant. You said something very important. Is that what system, I know it's not what you do, but what would you use to protect your data so you didn't get get hijacked like this? Because that, in essence, is is a huge problem. So yeah, 
there's not necessarily one system. So I'm speaking about a data management system being all these different processes and procedures we put in place that collectively form our data management program in essence. Um, first and foremost, train employees. <laughs> train employees. Doesn't matter what system you put in place, you can have the fanciest firewalls, the best password. If your employees are not aware that they can't be sending out ID numbers and ID copies willy-nilly, you're going to get in trouble. It, it doesn't matter. Most of our data breaches, I've dealt with three in the last month that an employee emailed <laughs> out something. Yes. Yeah. Emailed out, yeah. emailed out. So exactly. So we, we're speaking about employees emailing things out by accident. Now, it doesn't matter what systems you have in place. But in essence, I would put a policy framework in place for organizational measures. So your clean depth policies, your physical security policies, we lock away hard copies, all of that type of stuff to take to control our physical environments around us. I would then look at IT policies, um, password policies, server policies. All of these things are uh, passwords need to change monthly. Uh, they must be nine characters. You know, these type of things we can set how, how high you want the standards. I think one of my biggest irritations is when a client asks me, oh, can I change your password policy that it's not every month that changes, we'll change our password once every two years. That's pointless. It's a pointless activity. Um, so necessarily big policy frameworks and then your IT guys need to get on it. So it depends what systems you're using, what, uh, you know, what access you have. Teams is very good. SharePoint's very good. These, these internationals, uh, Google, things like that, they generally have very, very high security. But what's very nice with any system you want to use nowadays, because data management law is the new big thing worldwide, you can actually access um, these companies' privacy policies and how they do things. For example, one of our systems we use to manage our projects is called Trello. I was able to get a signed data agreement with them sitting in America. So they are open to these things. Get these things in place. Look what they're doing with your data. A lot of systems we use externally um, and we provide data to them vet those systems, go look at what those systems have, and then internally um, just make sure that you're changing passwords quite often, you've got firewalls on any internal systems and software that you have, your IT guys really, um, I, I haven't met an IT guy that's not great, at, this is what they do, mm -hmm. and then obviously your network protection, it's one of the weaknesses we see, um, if you've got an office, have a guest network, don't let them uh, come onto your main network. It's one of the easiest ways for someone to come and sit in your office and hack them, um, which we've seen happen <laughs> many a time. So those are the areas that I would look at necessarily, your organizational policies, your IT policies, a great IT infrastructure behind that. Um, yeah, I think that's yeah. what you guys think. Would you add anything? I think if you, if you wanted to implement systems to kind of assist with automating a few of the processes that that's, it's very readily available with some quick and simple research mm. on like little password, um, you know, password, password assistance and all of that, where it sends out reminders as to when to change your passwords. That's, it's very um, obtainable software and with some simple research, just making sure they're either puppy compliant or GDPR compliant or compliant with one of the major kind of, you know, legislations that we have in the, uh, internationally, you should be pretty golden. But I think research is absolutely key to ensuring that you're getting good quality stuff. Um, and, and yeah. And have the discussion with your IT, um, if, whether they're external or internal. I think our biggest thing is when we meet with clients, then we start speaking about IT things. And the person we're working with throws their hands up in the air and says, let me get the IT guy. And what that really shows us is no one really knows what's going on in the IT space which is also a risk in itself because what happens if that IT guy gets paid by someone on the side? Yeah. So you've got to have oversight of these things in your company. Um, I think we're living in an age where we can't actually say, well, I don't know about IT, I don't know about finance. We've got to, if you're a business owner and running organizations, we need to like wear multiple hats. Um, I'm not saying you have to be the biggest expert in IT. I'm a lawyer. I'm not the biggest expert in IT, but you need to know enough. You need to know how encryption works. You need to know uh, how your servers are protected, who has your super admin passwords and all of those type of things in order to protect your data. Um, it's very, very important. If, if I can just jump in here, I know we're talking a lot about IT and IT mm -hmm. systems. And usually when it comes to smaller companies, a lot of them want to run away because they're like, oh, we can't afford to put anything in place. Or there's only a few of us. So we're a small company. We're a small office. Mm -hmm. so we really need to do this. 
And it's important that you consider um, the system you put in place with regards to how your company runs. We're not saying that, um, you know, because of Poppy, you need to implement some expensive system onto your computer. Mm. There's different processes that you can put into place based on how your company works that can help. It doesn't require massive investments of money to have an efficient mm. data privacy program. And it's important that companies remember that because I think when you hear Poppy and data management, you tend to run away, but it's possible um, even for that little office with a few physical documents in the drawer somewhere. Yeah. What does it cost to force your employees to change their password every month? We have to change our passwords every month here at LabourNet. Um, the system actually blocks us. You will not get in unless you change your password every 30 days. And it costs us nothing. That's for free. And we often get told, oh, but I can't remember that many passwords. But then we're not going to remember when you get a breach either. So this is the problem. We need to commit to, to uh, uh, our data management and become invested in it. You need to invest yourself into it. It's not that we need massive amounts of, of money. Into it. No, agreed. Yeah, we're gonna awesome. take yeah, so I'm going to discuss a little bit about kind of the processes involved in terms of collecting information, processing it, and how, how we work with it throughout the process of having information that, uh, that we need. So in terms of getting consent, now this is, this is extremely important. As Sam mentioned earlier, we, we're very consent-driven and, and consent-focused within LabourNet. There are some justifications that we can utilize that I will go into a little bit more detail on in, in a moment. But... If, we, if we're looking at obtaining consent from our clients, and firstly, we need to make sure that it's voluntary specific and, and an informed expression of will. The, 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 the important part with this is we can't send out a mail um, to our clients basically stating, if you do not respond to this mail, we're gonna take that as consent because that's not an expression of will. We're not, we're not getting any feedback on that. So it's, it's always the best way to do it is, is to ensure that you're getting some form of a response. Uh, if you've got uh, a decent kind of IT um, department within the company, you can ask them to kind of just add two buttons at the bottom of the mail that says, I consent, I do not consent, that automatically sends a mail back. Um, as long as, you, as you're getting some form of a positive kind of response from your request for consent and it's voluntary and, and you know that you've specified the purposes for, for what you want that information for and you're collecting it directly from that individual, then, then you're good. Then there's no issues. Then you know that you, you are you sorted. Um, as we've mentioned before, uh, there are justifications. The reason why we are, are very consent driven is if you are to go under investigation and you're utilizing justifications, you need to prove why, 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 what gives you the, the ability to use that justification. And it just, it's a, it's a lengthy process. And then, you know, maybe you've, you've slipped it on, on one of the bits of information that you have. And then there's a bit of an issue. Whereas if you have consent, you don't have to prove anything. You've got everything on file, ready to go. There's all the consent and you sort it. Um, in terms of different kind of consent requirements though, like let's say I give you consent to process my information within your company um, for, for sales and you, you send me a box of wine every month. You can't necessarily process my special personal information as I have not consented to that. That's gonna be an additional consent that I would need to give out to you um, in order to do that. So my political views, my trade union information, religious information, et cetera, et cetera. And that also goes to uh, children's information as well. If you, if I had children and you wanted to process my children's information for whatever reason, uh, you would need to, to get additional consent for that as well. Uh, and the last one there is also direct marketing. So although I've given you consent to, to process my information and send me that box of wine and debit my account for it every single month, you, you cannot process, uh, you cannot market specials to me for, for that particular uh, purpose. It, it's, it's, that would need additional consent in order to do that. So as I mentioned, we need to get consent directly from the data subject. There are, as we mentioned, a couple exclusions um, in order to process information. So the, the, the few ways that we can do it is, as, as I said, and we've been through is consent, uh, utilizing a justification, but we can also collect information from a public source. So if that information is deliberately made public by the data subject, we can also process that information. Um, so if you're still receiving a lot of marketing calls, like the one that I'm probably receiving right now, uh, it's probably because my phone number is on some website as, as public information, and these companies are using data miners to, to mine that information and 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 essentially, I would assume, sell it to these, these yeah, call agencies and stuff. Marketing. Yeah, so they, they are allowed to do that because they've obtained this information from a public source um, and it's quite difficult to find where they are finding it because I would like to find it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
in saying that though, there is always um, processing limitations. So for example, in the previous slide, I mentioned that your consent that you've obtained from me needs to be very purpose specific. So you are sending me a box of wine on a monthly basis. The, the, the processes or the, the um, purpose needs to be specific on that. So the purpose of processing my information is firstly to debit my account for the subscription, to um, have my a home address so you could send the package through to that and you just send a full list of every single purpose that you would need to be using my information for there is ways that we can process that information further we'll touch on that a little bit later but it it needs to, there has to be limitations involved we can't have um people's id numbers for a um you know uh what, what's the word i'm looking for when you send a bulk mail out to everyone um Marketing. yeah like a direct like a market there's, there's a word for it so i can't think of the word I think <laughs> it's a bit of, <laughs> that's the one yes that's the one so yeah um we need to ensure that we have processing limitations and we have you know purpose specific information and and just the uh, adequate amount of information for what we need to uh, uh to obtain um, at any given point, I can object from, from you having my information, depending on a few things. If I have a contract in place with you, obviously that makes it quite difficult now. You can't delete my information, but we still have a contract in place and I've signed up for a 12 month um, subscription with your, your wine company. Um, but if, if there's no nothing that I'm tied into in terms of that information and I object to you having my information, then you would need to delete that information or offer to update it or yeah we'll cover that in a bit more detail a little bit later so in terms of accessing information uh we sam did touch on this a little bit in terms of limiting the access to to certain bits of information such as your your payroll side of the company does not need to access every single bit of it well the it company it department would not need to um, access your payroll information of of your employees uh, same way with like an office administrator who creates access cards doesn't necessarily need to access the cvs of those those staff members as well um in terms of you know the openness uh condition that we have in the in the eight conditions that sam mentioned uh we've got the pie the pie manual so if the if the personal information that you have of mine belongs to me if it's a contract and i'd like a copy of that contract I don't necessarily need to do a PIA request for that because it is my information. I am requesting a contract that is in place with myself. But if you're a private body and I'd like to enforce some form of a right in, in terms of, of whatever the case may be, and I need certain information that doesn't necessarily belong to me, it belongs to the company, I can then submit a, a PIA request for that information. Uh, if you're a public body, there's very little limitations on that. I don't necessarily need to have to enforce a right to request documents. And that's just kind of going with the whole openness, the transparency side of, of how we how we're going forward with the Poppy Act and the PIA Act as well. Um, if you are utilizing my information and you're sending me boxes of wine every month, and you're utilizing a shared drive such as Google Drive, OneCloud, uh, iCloud, OneDrive, all of those SharePoints, you, you've got to take into consideration that those, those, all those big servers are hosted in a different country. That's all hosted in the USA, the UK, Europe, all of that. So essentially you taking my personal information and you're putting it into one of these drives, that drive is stored in a foreign country. Those companies would have access to that information. Sure, they have the policies in place and the, the safeguards in place to ensure that they're, they're unhacked. But if you were to have an issue with that drive and you would call their, their customer support, for example, they would be able to access those informa that information. I would need to be informed of that, that you would be transferring my, my information cross-border. So we always recommend just including a cross-border clause into all consent agreements that, that you get sent out, just to ensure that you, you, know, you have the correct consents in place for that. And then as Sam mentioned as well, uh, when we're sharing information to, to an operator to process information on behalf of us, we need to ensure that the access is limited to, to those individuals or those companies 
they also don't necessarily need you know information abc when they only need to process our xyz information for our employees and clients or whatever the case may be so just ensuring that the access is limited controlled and you know exactly what information everyone has access to um, because if they don't have authorized uh, authorization to access certain bits of information that is classified as a data breach even if you have certain agreements in place if they don't have authorization to access that information that would be classified as a data breach and it would need to be reported so now we've got our consent for this information. We, we've got all of that in order. We've got our, you know, our limitations in terms of accessing it. Now, how, what do we need to do and, and put into place to ensure that we're utilizing this information correctly? So firstly, as I mentioned, it needs to be in line with the original collected purpose. So the purpose that you collected my information to send me wine boxes, we need to process it for that specific purpose. Um, we need consent and we need to ensure that, you know, either there's consent or there's a contract in place, as I mentioned earlier as well. Uh, we need data subject notifications, as Sam uh, touched on as well. I need to know exactly how my information is being processed, how it's being protected, and, and what, what you guys are doing as a company to, in order to protect that information. Um, and as I mentioned, there is ways that we can process information further than what we have got consent for, as long as it's in line with, you know, what we what we are processing it for, or the purpose that we are kind of utilizing it for. I don't know if you can can kind of elaborate on that a little bit, so it's a bit more detail. In terms of what we're using with, it for, yeah. yeah. In terms so, of further processing in general. So, in terms yeah. of section fifteen of Poppy, um, it it sets out a test for us that says you will be able to further process information that you collected for purpose A, we will be able to process it for purpose B, if purpose A and purpose B are very, very similar. And then we've got to take the five conditions that the Act gives us into account. So one of them is the nature of the personal information. So the more sensitive the information, so an ID number or an account number versus um, a, a cell phone number, the more sensitive, the less likely you will be able to utilize that information again for a new purpose. We also have to look at the um, consequences of processing. Does it help the, the individual? That these type of things, we look, did we collect it directly from the data subject or from a public source? So we consider these sort of factors. The act does give us automatic uh, further processing in some scenarios. If we have taken the information from a public record or from where the uh, data subject is deliberately made it public, or we've got consent, we can further process for uh, purpose B, no problem at all. So we can sometimes use our information again, we've just got to make sure it's very similar or that we have an automatic right. And then we move on to condition five. Now this I think is, you know, if you look at it quickly, it's quite a scary condition because it's, it's basically saying that we need to ensure all of our clients' information is up to date all the time, which is, if you've got 25,000 clients, it's an impossible task. You'll complete it this year and then next year you'll start from the beginning of the list again. So if we look at the condition carefully, it just says we need to ensure that we're putting in reasonable steps to keep that information up to date. So if we send out like a annual bulk mail with a form asking people to just confirm the information is correct or updated on their site or would they like to delete their information, that should be more than adequate in terms of the act. Um, and then as we spoke about just now with uh, with access limitations as well in terms of who can access what parts of the information so that's essentially you know your core kind of factors that you want to keep in mind when processing um information and you know also just be careful with in terms of hosting events in a company um for dietary uh, requirements you know a lot of the times people can just ask you know what what is everyone's religions we can't really ask that that's that's it's not it's a special personal information so if we don't have consent for special personal information it gets a little bit touchy with with in terms of asking those those kind of questions so it's a lot it's a lot easier and a lot safer to just ask you know does anyone have any dietary requirements because then that's a voluntary um, kind of response how we can achieve this kind of core function in, in a company i think the biggest uh, thing here is document 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 mm -hmm. um that privacy policy and your data protection policy is so so important because that's really going to set out these processes and our purposes and the privacy policy can also form as our data subject notification Correct. so by having a good privacy policy on your website you, number one, are going to know how to process the information. Your clients and your suppliers are going to know how that you're processing the information. Mm. And you're going to have taken care of your data subject notification, you know, your information quality. We can add a clause that you will update your information if it changes. 
we then sort of tick that box as well. So there is easier ways to achieve this, and it's really getting our documentation right. Mm -hmm. Focus on that privacy policy. Get your privacy policy in the top class uh, space, and then put it on your website. And I think that will create so much ease in this area. If I can add, I think one thing is, as well is just before collecting that information to actually consider what information do I need and what mm -hmm. do I need it for. Uh, very often we go to places that are giving us the same content form that you've, they've been using for the last 10 years but all they're utilizing is your phone number and your name but you're busy putting where you work um, all of those other details and it's very important to go back and have a look at the documents and see okay is that information we collecting information we're actually utilizing and we're actually using because again that will play into information quality if you're going to store those documents for 30 years in 30 years time is the stuff in there even still relevant? Yeah, I think one of the things I see all the time is, uh, are you a male or a female, other, et cetera. And often it's very unnecessary for them to know that information, whether I'm a woman or not. So that's one I see quite often mm. that, that we need, need to watch out for. Awesome. Yeah. So we've got now how to use information correctly. And this is essentially going to cover when we need to stop processing information. So firstly, we need to restrict processing of information. If the accuracy of it, if we can pick up that the accuracy of the information that we have is not necessarily perfect and it's not up to date and it's not adequate, we need to restrict our processing on that just to ensure that we are not, you know, for example, you can have one letter wrong in an email address and now you're emailing someone else. I mean, there's so many people in the world with email addresses. It's very likely that you, like, if you take the stop out of my email address, you're emailing someone else. Like, yeah, it's a little full stop. Yeah, that's going to someone else. So now you're processing someone else's information and they've got no idea why. <laughs> so that could be a bit of a problem. Um, if you no longer need the information for the purpose that was initially set out, we need we we don't we no longer can process that information because we're not using it for that initial purpose anymore. Then we get into a complicated side of things because we've got retention periods that we set on documentation. So if we no longer need it, we then retain it for the the set out period of time that we need to, and then we delete that information or archive it. But now we can keep that information in order well in in order to prove something if we're keeping it as proof for for something so a great example for this is like a panel beta that that has a whole bunch of invoices that they have kept um you know they kept past the retention period but they're keeping it as proof if something were to go wrong if that car's paint were to fade now all of a sudden um they need to be able to prove that listen this was done a certain amount of period a certain period of time ago we, we can't really fix this for you anymore that's fine the issue comes in if you look through the definition of processing in in the act it does include storage so if we're storing that information that's you know would we then be processing it and luckily obviously there is an exception for this so it excludes storage of information in order to to keep it as proof or with consent to keep that uh information for longer than the set out retention period um obviously if there's um protection of an individual or law enforcement any anything in terms of the law with it we we have to comply with that as well and um, if there's any restrictions on on the processing of information we need to notify the data subject when that restriction is lifted yeah that's everything from from my side so what happens if we use information without consent potential <laughs> fines <laughs> potential <laughs> fines it all depends on if it's going to be reported and yeah. investigated yes so um, a data yeah. subject can report your organization to the information regulator and of course that's going to trigger an investigation which is going to cause massive mm. reputational damage and mm. if as sam said you get a fine that's going to cause um huge monetary loss for your company yeah, as well random and you know if, with what james said it's important when someone says stop processing my information stop processing the information because if they've specifically asked you and have proof that they've requested you to please stop um and that request is valid and you continue you're ultimately in breach of copy i think it's important to note though in certain instances where data subjects do request us to object as james said yeah. uh, to delete information there are certain justifications where i don't have to if i have to have that information yes. by law i don't need to delete your information um if we have a contract uh, you can withdraw consent as well i think that's yeah. important for, for everyone to know so often uh, yes we're very very pro consent but we always have a justification to back us as well just in case uh, the employee does withdraw consent we can still have that information because of uh, justifications in copy yeah. i think my favorite one is that james was speaking about when you get those direct marketing calls and you're like please remove my information off mm. your system and do not contact me again 
It means do not yep. do that thing again. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So guys, storage. So storage, um, storing the personal information is obviously part of the personal information life cycle. And um, this part of the life cycle is probably, probably has really one of the highest risks of when um, you could actually suffer a breach because when, once we store information, we kind of forget about it uh, for that period. We don't really watch who has access to it and all of that. Um, so specifically with Poppy, it's important that the way you're storing the personal information is appropriate to the type of information that you're storing. So um, for example, if you're a school, you might have um, files of your various um, uh, what's students, students, teachers. Teachers, students and the teachers. I mean, school files, for example, would have children's information, parents' information, parents' employers' information. So those kind of files, you're going to need to keep a lot, have a lot more safeguards in place to look after that personal information um, versus maybe some, uh, you know, just mailing lists or just an email address on the side of someone's name. So it's very important to consider the type of information when you're trying to determine how to store the information. Um, according to Poppy, Poppy says reasonable technical and organizational measures need to be taken to prevent that unauthorized loss or damage and authorized access to the information. And as I said earlier, um, although we focus a lot on IT because that's obviously the way the world's going, it's important to consider that we're also talking about, you know, if you have a lot of doctor's offices, for example, have those um, massive cabinets full of client files, it's important in terms of things that are stored there, have a lock on those cabinets, ensure that you know who has the keys to those cabinets and where those things are being stored. Um, also very important to re regularly verify that the safeguards are being implemented. Um, so don't just forget about it. Go back and see, okay, the lock's still on, wait, who has the keys? Um, do I still know who has access to this kind of stuff? Do I still know what's here? Has somebody entered that I don't know about? And, um, you know, in deciding how you're going to store that information, ensure that you pay um, a due regard to generally accepted practices and procedures. So look at local processes, look at how things are done internationally, and that can kind of guide you. And just something else to consider with storage is to, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, information quality. We all want to store this information for years and years on, but do we actually need to store the information? Is it going to be valuable to us in 20 years? Um, a lot of companies spend a significant amount of money paying for Metrofile um, or storage units to store those boxes. But Poppy saying, no, listen, don't keep that information if you don't need it. So if you're not looking at Poppy and trying to understand Poppy, you might be costing yourself um, thousands a month and paying uh, for information that you don't really need to be stored somewhere. Yeah, I think the rule of thumb here is that your data degrades at a rate of 25% per year. So after four years, the, the idea is that that information is completely useless. People would have moved, changed jobs, changed home addresses, all mm -hmm. of that. So even though we want to hold on to all of this, it actually dead data. It's not valuable. So we need to learn to let go of dead data. We do. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so next is retention. So obviously, um, Poppy does say, you know, you are allowed to retain um personal information you've collected for a period of time, um, but it shouldn't be retained for longer than is necessary. So if you're not using the information, try not to retain it unless there's a chance that you are going to need it sometime in the future. Oftentimes it is required by law. Um, so you see we've listed a few here, for example, fake, uh, FICA and FACE say you need to hold the records for seven years, certain medical records are six years, CPA says three years, SARS five years, empl employee records three years. Um, this can be extended, obviously, with the consent um, of the data subject, if it's required by the law, if there's a contract in place, or just for historical or research purposes. Um, so, you know, there are those justifications to help companies. We're not saying throw away all your information when you're finished with it. If you think that you're going to use it in, a, in some time, um, we had, had an employer who said they wanted to keep employee records for a slightly longer period of time because they would like to use it to see going forward and filling vacancies. Um, you know, what sort of qualifications of employees are they attracting? Um, using that for research purposes, try, try to understand um, what they need to do within their organization, and that's fine. Um, I think it's important to remember Poppy is also not a big bad wolf. There are justifications, and it does allow you to do things to help grow your organization. Distraction. So distraction is a very important part of Poppy because, you know, we stand at a printer, you're page comes out, it's someone's banking details, cut off halfway, cool, let me just take it even on the side. 
who picks up that document no one knows so any information uh, any documents with personal information should be destroyed in a way that it cannot reasonably be re-identified or reconstructed so the best way have a shredder next to your printer put the document through there so we know that no one has access to it we're not just referring to paper we're also referring to it assets if you have an old laptop it's now shut down it's not working but you know that there's information on there um don't just take it and say hey this after broke you want to but would you like to use it you can fix it and have it no even it assets need to be destroyed so that no one can gain access to that i've actually and got um some pretty like a pretty uh, interesting point to add on to that yeah. Um, so as like a hobby, obviously you guys know I do like a lot of filming and photography and stuff. And I I did like a video shoot and I accidentally deleted all of the footage on on a hard drive. The whole lot I formatted it completely before I saved the data. And I found a program that you can plug the hard drive into your computer and it recovered everything from that formatted hard drive and everything from the previous format. So two oh formats goodness. back. So what's important to kind of keep in mind with it is when you format a hard drive, you're not deleting anything. Mm -hmm. All you're doing is you're telling the computer that all of the information that's on there can now be overwritten. So even though it says that you've got that much available space, that hard drive is actually still completely full with all of that information. It can now just be written over. So it's extremely easy. It, mm -hmm. it took me five minutes to recover 130 gigs of, of data. And I had everything plus before what I had on that hard drive at that given yeah, moment. It's, it's exact, extremely interesting. Exact same thing with my machine when I, I had an accidental situation. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna put it like that. <laughs> there was a dog and a cable and some some problems, but uh, we were able to pull everything off that machine. Yeah, everything. It's insane. And it's, uh, we were able to pull stuff off that wasn't on my iCloud, um, like documents that I had separated. Yeah. Not. It's insane. So what these, um, like you get certain softwares that allow you to still keep the hard drive and utilize it, but just ensure that that, so that the, the existing files on there are completely corrupted. So it does that by just inserting a lot of mumbo jumbo like code into all of the files and they just become completely impossible to, to bring them back to or reconstruct it as, as your slide mentioned. So yeah. you utilize those softwares. If you, you don't necessarily have to always completely throw away all those hard drives, but just make sure that you're using the correct softwares to ensure that that data is completely corrupted and it cannot be reconstructed. Thanks for that, James. And I think that just, um, you know, builds into what I said earlier about, you know, advancements in technologies mm -hmm. and us needing to be aware of what's happening. Okay. Um, that, you know, hey, what we're doing now may not be sufficient. We may need to start doing more because there's a risk of all of these different things happening. So thank you for that. Um, and then I think lastly was um, destruction at the request of the data subject. If they do ask you to please destroy the information, if you really don't need it, um, as we mentioned earlier, there are some justifications where you can say, no, sorry, we can't do it. Um, but if they ask, um, please destroy the information if they need to be destroyed. Security breaches. So as we mentioned and we spoke a little bit about it earlier, it's increasing exponentially in the corporate sector. Um, and it's just due to advanced hacking and phishing methods. And based on, I think, I think for all of us around the table can say the highest risk at the moment and every um, we'll security breach. <laughs> when I say it, everyone gets upset, but it's true. And you, and that's why I tell my clients, you, know, you can have all of the policies in place, mm. but it takes one person to not listen, um, you know, to just put their email address on the wrong thing or click open this link and get excited. And suddenly everyone's laptops in the entire company shut down. Yeah. So, um, but I mean, it's also as simple as if you've got an Excel spreadsheet with um, a mailing list on it of all of your clients that have now consented to your direct marketing that you're doing. And the individual that is sending out this bulk mail accidentally pastes all of those email addresses into the CC as opposed to the BCC. That's data breach done within even, seconds. Just even, a simple mistake. Let's say you are needing to email that list to me to authorize to send out some marketing mm. and you start typing sam when my email address is samantha and now you email it to a different sam but yeah. you thought you were emailing it to me we yeah. have got a full-blown data breach yeah mm. it's a simple it's so so simple. so so, so quick and simple yeah. we've all sent mails to the wrong people with the same first names different second names yeah um that that's happened and that's actually why now on my machine i've set my emails to delay i've also saw that seconds. you saw that on tiktok didn't you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've set my emails <laughs> to delay for 30 seconds so that if I have put the wrong thing in, because I tend to react quite quickly yeah. to things, I can then go, oh, yes, 
and then I stop mm -hmm. it in yeah. my app box. And um, a, an issue I saw happen quite often was when there's forms to be filled in and ensuring that you're sending an empty form through and not a complete form. Um, and actually, when there was a personal matter uh, where we were traveling and you need to fill out a little form from the bank um, mm -hmm. in order to get your currency. Um, so my mom said, no, this bank has sent it to me, please print it for me. And I open it and I'm like, this form is completely filled in. What are you saying? And it turned out he had sent us somebody else's form completely filled in, which said where they were saying, what flight they were on, all their banking details, yeah. how much money they requested. And at that point, probably hadn't come in. Um, I was still learning about it at that stage. But a mistake like that to know what flight the person on, where they stay, <laughs> how much money are they carrying, that's massive 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 so uh, i think forms are also something you really really need to just pay extra attention to in your organization especially if you send them out um and then obviously one way to mitigate these risks are obviously have policies in place continuous training is important mm. employees forget um so that awareness needs to be there and then lastly disciplinary action um you know failing to follow policies there are consequences to that ensure that you're fair throughout your organization when someone reaches disciplinary action needs to be taken because that sets a precedent for how everybody else in the organization needs to act. Um, yeah, I think we did touch on how do we mitigate the chances of a breach is obviously just investing in good data yeah. privacy. Yeah, ultimately. You know what we're going to have to do? We've, run, we've actually run out of time. Can you believe it? I've been watching it as well. I've also been watching it. <laughs> you, you, you know what it is. I'm going to change this from a KZN masterclass to a in conversation with Levenet because the conversation <laughs> has been absolutely brilliant. I've learned so much. I, I, I couldn't even button. Normally, I'm the one who butts in. And... <laughs> so, so that conversation was absolutely incredibly informing. And as you relating your stories, I mean, it's just exactly what all of us do. So. It's just it just makes the whole thing real so i'm going to ask a, a simple question is that you, it, the title is the practical side of poppy but is there a practical side because as you say the small things how it is there's the solutions and the consequences for not doing that are extreme so from a labor net point of view from the a team point of view what do you say it's 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 it you know what the thing is if you explain <laughs> it <laughs> if you explain it, it, it sounds extremely complicated and hectic, but the main goal of it is it just needs to become a standard practice within your organization. And honestly, it, it, it's very simple. Um, you know, you, you want to take on a new client, you add a simple clause into your current agreement that you put in place with them, done. You've got now consent. You, in that, in that same agreement, if it's a digital agreement, you have a link to your privacy policy, data subject notifications, done. Um, it's, it's very simple. It's just adjusting and tweaking a few small things and then training the staff correctly, making sure that that information in, in the company is handled correctly, and then just putting the policies for them to refer back to and make sure that they are following procedures. But it's, it sounds way more complicated than it honestly is. Um, it really, really yeah. does. It's I, yeah. I think from my side, really, the the practical side of Poppy means the practicalities of getting it into your organisation and not just this paper compliance. Mm. It's not just these policies floating around. It's finding those shortcuts and the stop, drop, and rolls and the cheat codes in your own organisation to make sure you're complying, but doing it in the most efficient manner that's not impacting your business. Yeah. So you're still going out there and doing what you do best at and sell and manufacture or whatever it is, but then you've got peace of mind that this is happening. Your employees know what's going on. If we have reached the poppy normal, as, as I call it. So yeah. what we also do on our side when we you know help our clients um, you know get to that compliance point in their in their journey is we also implement like an exceptions um, policy with an exceptions form. So if one of the policies that we implement is going to cause congestion and workflow in a certain section in the company, we can start seeing that exception forms to to bypass that certain section and that policy keeps coming mm -hmm. through. And then we can say, okay, well, listen, this is obviously causing a bit of an issue in this department. Let's take a, a look at the policy again and amend it because we don't want to affect workflow in the company. We want to try and find that happy medium where we can work with information correctly, but still be able to function as a business in a, in a, in a good manner. And I think something else is that, you know, there is going to be that big giant push at the beginning, especially for companies that are, that are doing their own thing and have no idea. Um, but after that, it just becomes a management thing. Mm. And, you know, that's the practice that the James was saying, it's the norm. Mm. Um, and that's what we want to achieve with looking at the practical side of things is how do we just go day to day with being compliant and not having to sit over our head all the time. Yeah. Okay, Yomna, 
that was the last thing anyone's going to say on this little conversation. You know what? We're going way over time. So what, I, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to put, I'm, for the folks at home, you can watch this on YouTube later, share it with your friends. The details will be on YouTube. So you can see this conversation doesn't end, end in the 18th century <laughs> right in front of you, because if I don't stop them, you'll just carry on and on. And I, as they're thinking, I'm, I can think of more questions to ask, and I'm not, because we've got, we've got run out of time. So I'm looking forward to doing the next session of KZM Masterclass, and we'll subtitle it in conversation with Labanet because <laughs> that's exactly what it is. So from everybody here on our side, thank you very much. The A-team on that side, incredible conversation. And uh, we'll see you the next time around. Thank awesome. you so much for having us. We'll see you next time. all functioning this is grant adlam and kzn top business masterclass today we've got the a team here again and obviously on the subject of poppy and the practical side of poppy um if there is such a thing the team's got yes there we go. i am i am okay so there, there you go that's uh, a monday morning start eh? nothing worked i tell you what's happened anyway so uh, we are now live and all functioning this is grant adlam and kzn top business masterclass today we've got the a team here again Did you see what happened there? We just heard a, a playback of our previous <laughs> conversation. I, I, I have four different computers going at once. So our YouTube fun, um, uh, was relaying back into the studio here. So technology <laughs> got bombed. So as you were saying, I wasn't hearing. I was starting, it was coming through four different other computers. <laughs>